continue discussing uh, uh, dynamics on moduli space series of curves, or to be more precise, moduli space of abelian differentials, or holomorphic quadratic differentials of uh, given type. And these a1 to ak are the, just the types of zeros of uh, holomorphic or abelian differentials. And um, so what we discussed in the last two lectures are basically we can get pr open pro uh, problems which are closely related to the action of SL2R on these spaces using flat structures, uh, flat structure of a holomorphic or abelian uh, differential with given types of zeros. And so basically the SL2R action comes from the, S the action of SL2R on C gives rise to an action of SL2R on this moduli space. And, uh, and we discussed some properties of, uh, so then SL2R, we considered the geodesic action of the geodesic flow, which was the same as the diagonal matrices of this form on H1, A1 to AK, um, and the recurrence properties of, uh, of this flow. And, uh, the, uh, and we discussed some of the statements based on the analogy of the action of this GT on the space uh, with the, basically the geodesic flow on hyperbolic, finite volume hyperbolic manifolds. And um, so but the goal was basically trying to understand SL2R uh, uh, orbit closures. So what are closed sets uh, in, in, in our moduli space which are invariant under the action of SL2R because we had some problems discussed in the first lecture which were all invariant under the action of SL2R. So uh, problems are related to rational poly polygons. And um, so maybe before I go on and discuss the SL2R part, I should say that no matter how nice, how many theorems you prove about the action of GT on these spaces, it's not going to help you much. And the reason is that uh, uh, the space of GT invariant, say, ergodic measures, even for uh, even in the nicest case of hyperbolic manifolds, even compact or finite volume ones, uh, is basically is, is huge. It's uh, and it's definitely, it consists of uncountably many ones, even if your manifold is a surface. And some really bad behavior happens, and I, and I just want to remark these because later we will do some things for the SL2R action, and I want you to basically compare the two behavior. And for example, so um, orbit closure and uh, measure orbit closures invariant under GT and measures invariant are, under GT are very different. And OK, so I'll draw some pictures here. Even the simplest, maybe you have your surface will have one cusp. So it's a hyperbolic surface. Um, you have orbit closures. You can have a geodesic which goes around one, two closed geodesic, you know, spirals around one geodesic one side, the other, the other geodesic the other side. And this is a closed set which is invariant under, these are infinite both sides, invariant um, under GT, it's a geodesic, uh, but there's no measure supported on that. Uh, uh, if you take the set of geodesic invariant uh, measures which on this hyperbolic surface X, definitely the limit of ergodic guys is not necessarily ergodic. Again, you can have the same example. You can have two geodesics and the geodesic that goes around spiral goes around one once and the other one once and twice and twice, etc. So, at, at the limit, the measure would be uh, basically the union of the measure supported on these two geodesics, which is not ergodic. But all these guys are whenever you have a closed curve, as long as it's connected, the measure is ergodic. Um, so, and also, so you have, so you have terrible looking. Uh, geodesic flow invariant measures such that when you look at the orbit closure, the intersection um, with 
so with an arc, can be a counter set. So uh, there's no way to control the shape of these kind of measures. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, there are a lot of uh, dense orbits which are not equidistributed. Um, so no, that's pretty bad. And in fact, there are the space of all these geodesic flow invariant measures on a given uh, compact surface is a very nice space. And uh, it has rich structure. The whole tight mirror space embeds into that. There are a lot of RKs embedding in, embedded into that. So it's a huge space. And it's nice to study, but it's, you can't classify anything. And uh, maybe I should one one more thing. There are that we discussed maybe last time, geodesics can diverge to infinity. And this is an example of such thing. <laughs> and it's, I mean, in our case, we have the geodesic flow, and our, somehow the cusps are much more complicated. So geodesics can diverge to infinity for all sorts of weird reasons, which are very hard to understand. Um, so it's pretty difficult to to deal with, if, I mean, if you know some geodesic invariant measure uh, for the action of the geodesic flow, OK, uh, good luck. You can't say much about it, in fact. Uh, but I mean, if you were yesterday in, um, in Professor Margulis's talk, you know which direction we are going. Even though the GT invariant measures are, um, are quite complicated, as soon as you add the UT, which is 1, 1, 0, T, is unipotent, um, all these problems somehow, I mean, we expect all these problems to disappear. So we'll, uh, yeah, yeah, OK, so I'll, I'll remark on that. Unfortunately, we are not there yet, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For in, the, in the case I'm talking about, um, yeah, you don't need to do anything. And maybe I'll just start with, if you, if you haven't, I mean, it's very likely that you've seen the uh, Ratner's theorems, but maybe I'll give an example uh, just due to Shaw and then Payne, which is some uh, variations of that, which doesn't use unipotent flows if, you, if you're not familiar with them. That says that, for example, if you're dealing with H3 and a hyperbolic manifold of compact and, um, and actually can be generalized to finite volume hyperbolic manifolds, um, OK, if you have a line a line geodesically embedded is just a geodesic. And the orbit closure can be wild. There's nothing you can say about it. But if you have H2 maps into H3 and then goes to H3 over gamma, which is pi 1 of uh, your m, more or less, uh, then the result says that, and you have a map f, which is um, it's kind of a geodesic embedding. It sends geodesics uh, to geodesics. Then f of h2, if you take the closure, is actually uh, is an immersed, not necessarily embedded, hyperbolic submanifold. And our, of course, our, our case is very similar to that. Uh, because we have the SL2R, which when you take the quotient by the, uh, the group of rotations, will give you H2. Uh, so, so this is the type of example uh, that somehow gives some hope for, I mean, they're all the, the hyper, I mean, hyperbolic submanifolds of a manifold. They're very really nice set of things, basically, inside H3. So it can be so wild. And, um, and these are all based on results of. Um, Ratner's theorem, which says that in general, so this is the general, but we, we don't use this, so uh, it generalizes basically. I mean, it does, it, this theorem uses uh, Ratner's theorem, uh, so it's one of the applications. But it's the more general case of this, that if you have a G, which is just a, any Lie group, basically, say, connected. If you have a gamma, which is a lattice, and you have U, which is just generated. You can imagine that U is a one, the, uh, one uh, parameter family of unipotent matrices inside G. Uh, 
So it, that means u minus i has it's a nilpotent matrix. So but it, even if it's generated by unipotent elements, um, you can look at g over gamma, and then the u, the orbit closures of u x for for each x in x, the u x bar is uh, again homogeneous, which means that you can find some h inside g such that um, this is basically h over some gamma one. It doesn't say that it's easy to classify all these things, but uh, it says that they're all homogeneous. And um, I mean, it's a great result that I can't definitely do justice to just today by there are so many applications that you have probably seen in different places. But um, maybe I should mention, so, um, so this is, uh, there are related results and different treatments due to uh, Margulis and Tomanov, and then Margulis, Danny, Margulis, and then uh, basically, I, I I don't want to go to details of of uh, the all, all the things you get from uh, from Ratner's theorem, but but it's stronger than what I sketched here. So it says that the orbit closure is homogeneous, but it also says that all these things that I somehow remarked. Um, are going to behave completely differently from the geodesic flow. Basically, orbit closures and measures are the same things. So every orbit closure is a support of an invariant measure, which fails here. Limits of ergodic measures are ergodic, which is a theorem of Moses and Schaub, based on Ratner's theorem. So you have to use a little bit more uh, to do it. And um, what actually Ratner also did was uh, also the invariant measure, so maybe a part of the theorem is that instead of looking at orbit closures, even if you are interested in orbit closures, you can um, start with invariant, u invariant ergodic measures are supported on basically the orbit closures. And uh, basically what it says is that there is a measure, as a unique ergodic measure on this, the orbit closure of ux, uh, which becomes equidistributed with respect to the some kind of harm measure on ux bar. So basically, density of an orbit and the equidistribution are the same thing. You don't have this bad behavior that something becomes dense on some submanifold and it's not equidistributed. It spends some more time. More person, I mean, so spend some time in an unfair way in some sub part of some part of your uh, manifold, or density and equidistribution are the same thing. So, I hope I didn't. And and the f so these are the first four cases, and the case of the fifth case, there is uh, there are uh, Margulis and Danny, which is actually quite quite important for. for uh, applying Radner's theorem almost in any non-compact set prove that uh, the, these uh, unipotent flows are are uh, also non-divergent. So it means that um, this kind of thing doesn't happen. And maybe before I forget, in uh, this kind of non-divergent things, that it, it, if you have a for every point, if it, if if you know if it's, it's the 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 orbit of the uh, unipotent flow is not going to to spend too much time in the thin part without any good reason, and uh, and this uh, has been generalized for our setting for exactly for our UT by uh, Minsky and Weiss proved the non-divergence for uh, for the UT in this SL2R. for this, this SL2R action called the horocycle pole. OK. Maybe I'll go there. So if you, if you have, I mean, the, the Ratner's theorem is, is I mean, very general. But even if you go back to um, here, the case of hyperbolic surfaces,
uh, there is a flow which is called the Hora cycle flow, which is basically in the SL2R case, when if the unit tangent bundle you, you uh, identify the SL the action of but just SL2R is just uh, the action by the unipotent matrix 1, T, uh, 0, 1. Um, so the special case of Radner's theorem, which was done cert certainly, I mean, studied much earlier, um, is the case of horocycle flows on, say, hyperbolic surfaces. And in this case, um, say, maybe I'll just mention, for example, the type of result. Uh, it would be that if you have X, it, if it's compact and hyperbolic, uh, so this goes back, I think, to first and bit. Then it's uniquely ergodic, the horocycle flow, which means that the Lebesgue measure on X is the only UT invariant uh, ergodic measure. So, or the multiples would be the only ergodic measures for the action of uh, the horocycle flow. But of course, if you are dealing with a non-compact one, then you have to deal with uh, with closed horocycles around the cusps and. Um, Okay, I think this um, goes back to, I, I'm not sure if I can uh, use the right references, Bowen and Marcos and Danny, et cetera, that basically all the ergodic measures are the Lebesgue and these closed ones. So it's kind of, um, if, sorry? But then later. Compact case? Oh, okay, yeah, maybe this is, okay, maybe this is for the horosphere, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, the yeah the non uh, non compact, <laughs> uh, but but okay maybe maybe I sh this is for horse spheres. The um, so we will see that the closed horse cycles, of course, there are uncountably many of them. You can move them by the geodesic flow, go to infinity. But uh, somehow, apart from the from that issue, if you are dealing with some compact part, there are not so many of them. There's all the I mean, they become equidistant from the other side. But they are e everything is either closed and uh, or equ becomes equidistributed. And you know when it when it's closed, when the corresponding geodesic goes to infinity, and when the corresponding geodesic comes back to the thick part infinitely many times, then uh, the core cycle that you are dealing with uh, becomes equidistributed. And um, so, in our setting, what we would like to get is a statement about all um, UT invariant ergodic measures, uh, all UT invariant ergodic measures uh, for the action of the horocycle flow. And um, this is, I don't think it's, uh, it's very difficult to get, or there are some results known that I will mention, but some special cases. Uh, but uh, so the nice thing about our case, the case of H1, A1 to AK, I mean, the problem is that it's, it's not a homogeneous space. The, um, you, can't, you, you can't quite identify the unit tangent bundle at the point with anything. You can't move things around. Uh, depending on the group action, there's no big group acting on this space. Uh, but, but there's some, something which is nice, and that is, maybe I mentioned this, there are two submanifolds going through a point. They're not submanifolds, but subspaces. Uh, so are stable, which play the role of stable and unstable uh, uh, manifolds or foliations. Um, that is, if you have, remember, if you have Q, which is a holomorphic quadratic differential, and maybe you have set of zeros. So if you have a, locally, if you have a saddle connection alpha, which is a geodesic joining two of your singular, um, uh, singularities, um, if at Q, maybe the, the way, let's say, if you are dealing with a billion differential, uh, the map, your coordinate, sends Q to the coordinate system is just the integral of alpha of Q. So if, if you have an abelian differential, you can integrate your one form over alpha. And when you do the, which is, 
I write it as xy, by which I mean x plus iy. It's a complex number. And when you act by, say, ut, <coughs> ut of q will send your alpha to x plus ty and y. So basically, you have, say, w plus and w minus, which is you, you start with q, and then you have a set of holonomies. Every holonomy has a real part plus i times a, um, uh, imaginary, I mean, an imaginary part. And you can say, oh, OK, so you, you give it q, you look at all, everything uh, in that local coordinate system with the same real part. Means that the, when you take the holonomy of alpha, the real part is the same. You can take everything, all the q prime, if, the, if for every alpha, the real part of the integral alpha over q is the same as the real part of integral alpha over q prime. It is actually, it is possible. It is possible. Yeah, it's, it's not so easy, but, but it is possible. Yeah, you can also. Mm, I'm not sure. But it's possible to, to get, I think it's, I mean, you, there, are some, there are some issues because you want, it is possible to get things, uh, but you have to make sure what you are proving at the end. Actually, there are results by Sasha Bufetov, but what he gets is that the length of, for example, of a closed geodesic is not exactly the length that we started with. It's some length that comes from this partition, which might be a little bit different from, and the formula is very uh, sensitive to even ch changing the length a little bit because it's exponential, the growth. But yeah, but I'm just looking at more, it's more like just geometric way based on analogy with some hyperbolic, um, hyperbolic. No, it's not, and also it's not uniform, the hyperbolic. You have to be very careful about what happens when you get close to the uh, thin part. So this, then, then you get, based on this, you get some sp subspace. So it's Q, uh, I'm just, it's kind of like the horosphere foliation in the case of Bowen and Marcus. Uh, I guess um, it's kind of you have a horosphere, and these are the point that we expect to basically when you go along the geodesic flow. If you were dealing with a hyperbolic system, you know, the negatively curved manifold, you would expect that every point Q and Q prime. When you go back along the geodesic flow, you would expect the distances to go to zero exponentially fast. But this just doesn't happen. Uh, but still, by using results of Forney, and um, there are also, I think, Vich has a different treatment of this. Basically, as long as this geodesic that you go, you are basically looking at, spends most of its time in the thick part, you get uh, the, the two geodesics would get, would, would, um, get close to each other. And um, so, so that, that helps a lot. But basically, if you, if you use this kind of, Result, you can prove the joint will be Lenishaus that you can prove that any uh, oh, okay, what I call horosphere invariant, but by which I mean oh, it's almost you can write it in terms of somehow uh, differently that there, there, this, there is no it's not vague, but uh, since I'm not going to talk about it much more here, I just keep it vague. So the horosphere is like you have Q and you have all the horosphere of things. Size of that? Uh, sorry? What's the size of that? What does that mean? Uh, it's half the dimension of the, the space. space. Of the whole space, yeah. So it's nice, it's yeah. Maximum yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's maximum. Yeah, it's quite yeah. So if it's a uh, invariant measure is um, is geometric. <laughs> and in the case of, for example, so as you see here, we, had, we have a statement that I didn't write down. But what happens for hyperbolic surfaces is that if you have a geodesic, which is recurrent, uh, then the corresponding horror cycle uh, becomes equidistributed. That's part of the theorem in the case of hyperbolic surfaces. And the same thing, maybe the result for the recurrent ones, um, they're also done by uh, Ursula Hamstadt somehow a little bit differently. But even if it's not recurrent, um, basically you can cl uh, classify all of them, and they all come from uh, somehow moduli spaces corresponding to subsurfaces 
uh, of, uh, I'm not saying what it means, subsurfaces of your surface. And you can classify all of them. And for example, you can prove that uh, orbit closures are the same as uh, invariant measures. That is, um, for, for NV orbit closure, you have an invariant measure. And then the orbit of every point becomes equidistributed with respect, I mean, inside this orbit closure. And also, you can prove that the limit of ergodic measures uh, is ergodic. So it's very similar uh, to what happens for hyperbolic surfaces and the horocycle flow. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is pre Ratner. The, you know, I mean, the, the trick, the only difficult, I mean, the only tricky part here is um, to get all of them. The fact that the recurrent ones become equidistributed is basically a mixing argument. And, um, but then, yeah, but then you have, but the problem is the cusps here that you have to deal with carefully. But it's somehow, if you, you had some weird measure which is invariant on the horse sphere flow, that would be a counterexample for any kind of conjecture for horse cycle flow invariant measure. But you want to analyze this case. And there is no geodesic flow invariant condition, so it's just something only about the, the uh, something avoid uh, that you can do without using the geodesic flow. But that's almost the end of story. And there are also for UT, UT invariant measures, um, they are on. H1, A1, AK, they are results by um, actually um, there's some special cases by Markov, Morris, and Eskin, and uh, Kalta, and uh, Wortman. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you much about what they are, but it's kind of a, either it's low genus for genus two in some special cases, and, um, and this is also for things that come from weak surfaces and you have marked points. So it's, these are very special cases. And in all these cases, you have some subset of this modular space. You have the action of UT. And the result is that all UT invariant ergodic measures are nice. But it's kind of very, very special cases. And that's the, yeah, I think that's the end of the things we know uh, about the UT invariant ergodic measures, unfortunately. And for our applications, what matters, um, I mean, for many of, for most of them, you get much stronger, you get stronger results if you know UT invariant ergodic measures. Um, but I'll see, I'll, maybe I'll remark uh, what goes wrong if you want to do Ratner's uh, theory. But uh, what we want to, what I want to discuss for the rest uh, of the lecture is that, uh, some results about uh, measures which are invariant under the upper triangular uh, matrices here. So the, the space, basically the group generated by GT and UT. So, uh, so I'll remark on this theorem uh, after I state it. So first of all, is any, so on H1, A1 to AK, any p invariant measure. Okay, I'll add ergodic, but it doesn't matter. Is also uh, SL2R invariant. Let's see why we care about this. And uh, and the second one that. So we want to say what all SL2R invariant measures are. And um, OK, we can't, I mean, the, the ones, the known ones, what are the known SL2R invariant closed sets um, in, in these spaces? So sometimes the, this, the nicest one in some, some sense uh, are the ones which will give you a surface in the moduli space. That is, you, you start with Q, it's a copy of uh, H, the, your SL2R, or the unit tangent bundle of H, that you send into H1. 
And then you take the orbit closure. And sometimes it could be a, a two-dimensional thing, right? It could be a surface, the unit tangent bundle of a surface. And in this case, it's called a Veach surface. And there are examples of. Oh, OK. No, no, no. Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Beach surfaces or Teitmuller curves, I don't know. <laughs> and if Beach had examples of these, like if you start with a, uh, the, the uh, regular n-gon uh, Beach proof that uh, if you glue the parallel size and they get the surface and do the and then look at the what what you get in the modular space of abelian or quadratic differentials, it would be a surface closed surface. I mean, it's not a compact surface. Or you always have cusps, uh, but there are examples of this by different people. Ward, I don't know. Um, there are here and there you see some examples. It's usually difficult to prove that you get a weak surface. There are very interesting results by Martin Muller and uh, okay, of course, Beach uh, and uh, by many other people. And um, and the case of and I think this is the hardest part of the theorem. The, the I mean the conjecture or whatever. If you want to get SL2 invariant measures, it's really difficult to find the weak ones, uh, weak surfaces. And the case of, uh, maybe I didn't leave enough space here. The case of uh, genus 2, uh, all the beach surfaces by, uh, all the beach surfaces were classified by Macmullen and uh, also Karikalta. Uh, and um, also, um, they, and, and they found that there are, when, when you have an abelian differential on the surface of genus 2 with two zeros, uh, there are cases of non-trivial SL2R invariant measures which are not weak surfaces. Uh, but somehow they are closely related to weak surfaces. I, I don't go into details, but I mean, there's a lot of uh, interesting things uh, related to just genus 2, uh, the dynamics of SL2R in, in this genus 2 case. And the, the very interesting idea that would give you uh, quite interesting results, even though you still have to work hard to get the, the classification statement, is that you can reduce the, the case of genus 2, you can reduce the, the problem or get a lot just by using Ratner's theorem for the product of hyperbolic surfaces. So it's just Ratner's theorem for SL2R divided by SL2Z cross SL2R divided by SL2Z and the action of SL2R by like diagonal, that act, the, uh, diagonal action. That's already quite difficult to, to prove that things are like a, the, you have uh, uh, the invariant measures can be classified in a nice way. So that's already a non-trivial statement. And in case of genus 2, what, uh, at least maybe I know more about Macmullen's uh, approach, uh, the, it's very nice that you can always somehow decompose your surface using uh, homologous geodesics uh, and cut it into two surfaces and use Ratner's theorem uh, for the product of two surfaces. And then you have to uh, use a lot of other interesting things to prove that basically you have uh, invariant measures uh, which are supported on uh, curves uh, which have uh, basically whose Jacobian has real multiplication. Uh, by uh, quadratic form. I mean, they are, they are interesting. They are related to weak surfaces, but also what they show, and then what uh, Martin Muller uh, actually generalizes for general, in the general case, even though he doesn't get new example, is that if you have a weak surface or some of these invariant measures, then the, the actual curve, you don't see any symmetries on the curve, but the Jacobian will have some extra symmetries. The, the endomorphism will be bigger, but still you can't get invariant measures, just some uh, necessary condition. But there's a lot of very interesting work that goes into the classification in the case of uh, genus 2 already. I hope I didn't miss any one's work. But basically what happens is that if you have SL2R invariant measures, um, uh, you know, orbit closures, again, the same, you have the same properties through their work, which is highly non-trivial. But orbit closures are the same as invariant measures, and limits of invariant measures are invariant measures, and all, all these things. You have the same things. And so, so what I want to the theorem, too, is that if you have um, SL2R, 
invariant measure. So any ergodic SO2 R invariant measure is uh, supported on uh, on an affine, which is just piecewise linear. Uh, sub I'm not, I don't know, I call this sub-manifold, but I don't mean any, <laughs> I don't mean that it's nice. Uh, locally piecewise linear subset, subspace of uh, H1A1 to AK. So remember that locally H1A1 to AK is a piece, I mean, it's locally linear. And you can, and the coordinate is just the holonomies around the closed curves and holonomies around some geodesic, some lines basically joining uh, uh, singularities and some closed curves. So it makes sense to talk about piecewise linear subspaces. So these are, so you have the holonomy coordinates. And it basically what it says is that locally around the point Q, this, your, your space is uh, given by the solutions of finitely many linear equations in terms of your, the holonomies around the curves and saddle connections. And uh, maybe I'll write something here. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the, the proof is completely different. Uh, so, so here, uh, maybe, uh, so here it's a corollary and remark. Uh, you see, even if you know ergodic measures, uh, all the ergodic measures, you don't, again, you don't necessarily know all the uh, orbit closures. But so it's just, let's see, see one example. Uh, so this is, if you have one example, if you have an action of Z, so you have a transformation, measure preserving transformation on your space X. And then um, in this case, if you know things about ergodic measures, you would get things about orbit closures. Because if you have X, TX, Tnx, you know, you can get a sequence of measures by taking the average of, uh, uh, so your measure, so measure of mu uh, is just uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, T of your, like if you want a measure of a set, you can take T of, or maybe I'll do it with minus in general because T inverse is measurable. T inverse of U, the measure of U, measure of T inverse of U, plus measure of t minus n of u divided by n. You can read my handwriting. handwriting. Uh, <laughs> OK, so you get a sequence of measures. And this, this measure, I mean, this is a very nice but simple trick in ergodic theory. So these measures, any, any uh, weak limit, weak star limit of mu n is, again, t invariant. Or you can start with x and take Tx, you know, Tn of x, and um, just look at the measure, the counting measure on x, the Tn of x, and divide it by n. And um, you get, this way you get measures which are invariant under T. And if you know, if for example, if you, you start with a uniquely ergodic system, you say all these new n's uh, should tend to the, that unique one. Or if you can classify all T invariant measures, the limit of all these new ends should tend to one of these measures or some of these measures or whatever. But, but you get by taking a measure which is supported on x, t, x to t, n of x, basically from the measures you can say something about orbit closure. It's just because it's z. But you can't do this in SL2R. So unfortunately, SL2R is because you know, it's not amenable. If you start from SL2R, if you know all the ergodic measures, uh, for the SL action of SL2R on any space. And OK, so how, what do you know about orbit closures? You can embed your SL2R and then take the measure, which is invariant on bigger, bigger balls, and take limits. But the limits won't be invariant under the action of SL2R. The limits will be what is called uh, stationary measures. So maybe I. So if you have a measure mu, on SL2R, um, it makes sense to talk about stationary measures. 
So basically, these are, uh, so it's a stationary measure if on x, on which you have an action of SL2R. So for example, if, you, if the, the measure is, uh, is supported on three points, and the general, it's usually it's the Lebesgue measure class. But if it's three points, maybe you, know, you have delt G1 and, uh, and G2. You know, if maybe you you know that the measure at x measure is equal to measure of g measure of u is always measure of g one of u plus measure of g two of u divided by two. Does it mean that the measure is invariant under the group generated by g one or g two? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So that's a quite a difficult question. So in general, you can start with something which is stationary measure, and uh, uh, which means that uh, it's new. If nu of mu is the integral over SL2, uh, g star of mu uh, d g, but g is mu of g. Maybe of mu. Sorry. So it's basically, you know that the average with respect to this measure is is invariant, but you don't know that it's really the measure is invariant under all these things. And what you can do that if you have a, if you um, if you want to know orbit closures, if you start with this, we want to say maybe oh okay, so I start with x, and if you want to do the, exactly the process that we had for the, the z action by taking a measure supported on x t x to t n of x, and do it for S L two R, what you end up with if you start with the point, you end up with a measure which is um, stationary with respect to the action of SL2R. And there's a very nice trick um, uh, stationary measure. And it's not clear at all if it's invariant or not. Uh, and um, in fact, by a very nice but quite elementary trick, which is a special case of something done by Furstenberg, you'll see that this statement is true if and only if any okay, stationary measure, uh, I mean, where mu is, uh, is very nice, mu is nice, is somehow supported on some Lebesgue. It's not, uh, unfortunately, we don't get it for something which is supported on finitely many points, but uh, with respect to something which is nice, any stationary measure, uh, or SL2R stationary measure, uh, is actually invariant under the action of SL2R. So what this implies, uh, I'll get rid of my remark. Um, so what it implies actually, uh, so basically, theorem one and two plus uh, a result which is joint work with Amir Mohammadi implies that all the orbit closures of SL2R orbit closures mm, are basically supports of SL2R invariant measures. And therefore, uh, uh, they are all piecewise linear. Uh, piecewise, uh, sub, they are all piecewise linear sub subsets of your H1, A1 to AK. And I should say that all the known results for now are rela either related to some beach surface, or um, they are basically some kind of uh, things that you get by taking like ramified covers of all like abelian differentials of a certain type. Um, and but we, we are not uh, claiming anything. No, no, there's not much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I suspect that base, uh, yeah, I mean, but there are no non trivial examples. Uh, apart, I mean, the, every, all the examples, known examples, and there are some finite net results and some genus three, there's, there's some work by Moeller and Bainbridge, and there are different types of results to say, the, the only, like in genus three, there are only finitely many types of beach surfaces, or 
it, everything is, or like if you mar put marked points, or like all the special cases that, which are known as everything is either ramified covers or something which is related to a weak surface. So it's a, it's quite. So that's a separate question. That's a separate question. Yes, so, so first of all, I want to say that uh, yeah, P invariant and SL2 invariants are the same, and SL2 invariants and orbit closures are the same, but this, this uses some, uh, uh, it's very similar to what happens. You have to say that the orbits don't spend so much time close to some submanifold, and it's kind of uh, what uh, was used by Eskin and uh, uh, Moses and Margulis. And what, how we treat the infinity, if you treat submanifolds like infinity and um, some results like that, do you get that SL2 invariant and the orbit closures are the same. So I want to actually say a little bit about the proof. <laughs> so let's see. Where. So, so why? Uh, Ratner's type argument um, seems that it doesn't work. So if you were in Professor Margulis's talk yesterday, maybe you noticed and he mentioned something about proof of uh, Ratner's theorem and uh, how you get that all the, if you have a unipotent, say, one parameter subgroup, you want to say all the invariant measures are, are very nice. And essentially the first step, you have something which is invariant under one parameter subgroup and you want to get extra invariant uh, under something else. And what is used in these um, results uh, is something called polynomial shearing or polynomial divergence of Hor cycles. And I like, draw a picture here since you hear it, you're, you hear it from a non-expert, so it's not so good if this is the first time you hear it, but I'll just tell you my understanding. <laughs> so the, if you have two points, which are very close and very like, generic for, and say this is the, the orbit of UT, and you want to say get an additional invariance under some other direction. So they, you can analyze really how if you start with two points which are very close, how UT of Q and UT of Q prime uh, diverge. They diverge very slowly. And first, what happens is that if they are very close and very nice points, generic points, first one point is ahead of the other point. But if you ignore that, if you just look at the distance between the two, I mean, the, from one point, the closest point, and the other orbit, what happens is that um, you get something in the centralizer of UT, but okay, you get some extra additional invariance somehow. What you get is that, okay, you want to say it's invariant under this new guy V. We want to find points in this somehow generic subset of your, your manifold which are somehow in the direction of V from each other. Or you want to find a lot of points Q, maybe I'll call it Q tilde, with some friends in the direction. It's like your friend is pushing you or moving you in some direction, has friend in the direction of V, or Q tilde prime. And there's a lot of work that goes into really showing that this additional, this, a lot of times, if they are very close, there's some direction. V in the centralizer, that there are Q tilde and Q tilde prime, which are away from each other, it's like in the direction of V. And if you're in a homogeneous setting, this V has some reasonable meaning. But there's something very important, um, and that is you also, I mean, everything is measure, measurable. So you want this, prop, this behavior, the fact that Q tilde has a friend Q tilde prime in the direction of V, in some direction, to happen for a very long time. And that would allow you, because you want to make sure all the points are in a good set. And if it happens for a very long time, for a very long time, I mean, if this is T, I want this to be like delta T, you know, very long time, to, to make sure that the point here is in any kind of nice set you want. And you use, uh, that, uh, uh, Professor Margulis also mentioned using ergodic theorems, Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and that's where it's, I think, used. So somehow you have to find a lot of points, a lot of nice points, and um, uh, where every point in that has a friend in the direction of V. And that plus a lot of other work uh, would imply invariance. So, but it's, 
It's about UT and about how things diverge and these things happening in a very, very long time so that you can, you can make sure you, everything is in the right place. Um, but um, the problem is that we, we don't know how to prove uh, so-called, um, uh, I guess it's called polynomial, it's called polynomial divergence because uh, basically horror cycles diverge polynomially very slowly. Uh, and using shearing. Uh, but, okay, we don't have that, that's unfortunate. But we want to use the geodesic flow to, to get the additional invariance. But, okay, the problem with using the geodesic flow, there are a lot of things actually about how geodesics diverge. Basically, that's, um, that's all from uh, multiplicative ergodic theorem that I maybe hopefully mentioned quickly. But the main problem is that um, geodesics diverge very quickly. So maybe you can make sure, so maybe I'll just mention something related to multiplicative ergodic theorem. Also let it's theorem. So that means, that says that if you have a point, a generic point, uh, so okay, so you are in the nicest possible setting. Uh, I'm not going to deal with some uh, pathological cases. And if you have the, say, they have the geodesic flow on, um, on one of these the, the spaces that I discussed, so a special case. So what it, uh, what it says is that um, you basically know generically what happens if you, instead of x, which is q, actually, if you start from q prime and then go along the geodesic flow, how, how the, the difference will diverge or what happens to the difference, or infinitesimally, Basically, what it says that for almost every, and that's already problematic, for almost every Q with respect to the measure, which is GT invariant, so mu is GT invariant, uh, you have a flag V1, which is the whole, uh, and you have it for any bundle that happens, but say, say take W plus, everything which grows under GT, V1, V2, Vk and numbers lambda one, lambda two, lambda k, such that if v is something, so this is uh, the set of points. Maybe v one is the whole thing, then v two is a linear subspace inside of that, and v two or v three, such that is if v is in v i, but it's not in v i plus one, the orbit g. Okay, minus t log of uh, norm of g minus t v. If you look at start from v, go along the geodesic flow, start fix some norm on your space, and see how the length of this norm uh, grows. Then it grows exponentially, and these are the, these numbers are called Lyapunov exponents. Um, divided by t is lambda i. So imagine, and then m i. If, if mi is dimension of vi plus 1 minus vi is the multiplicity. So the vi's can have multiplicity, which can cause a lot of trouble. But imagine the they are simple. That is, multiplicities are all 1. So what this says is that if you start from q, then if you have a generic direction and go along gt, the vector grows exponentially fast, and e to the lambda 1. It grows like e to the lambda 1. So if you have two points, um, and then everything is piecewise linear, so it's, you can identify it with the vector, the difference between the two. If you have v, you know, you can assume, you can see that if you go for a very long time, when the vector v, which is very, very small, becomes uh, norm 1, uh, lambda 1 wins, maybe the vector that you started with have different components in, uh, of type v, lambda 1, lambda 2, et cetera, lambda k. But at, when, when the norm is 1, you know, the, the component from uh, the highest Lyapunov of exponent grows like e to the lambda 1. The guys from the second one grows like e to the lambda 2. So the lambda 2 is, yeah, you have to be generic. This is, but then, you know, there's a, there's a good sign that is, um, Basically, if you, you can use maybe multiplic multiplicative ergodic theorem to start from a point and the direction v, and actually v 
this highest Laplace exponent should win at some point. But the problem is that uh, this, when they are, is a very short time that your vector v has norm one because it's growing exponentially fast. And for doing these kind of argument, you have to make sure that all the points are in a compact set of positive measure, which is very hard to guarantee. So maybe I'll just draw a picture here and uh, say roughly why, what we want to do. So this is an, um, so instead of a polynomial shearing divergence, uh, we want to use something which is uh, uh, used actually in a very, very nice way in a paper by uh, my work of Benoit and Kant in actually understanding um, stationary measures uh, in some homogeneous setting. Um, so the idea from them, instead of using polynomial shearing, you want to use uh, exponential, uh, exponential drift. And um, OK, let's see what I can say about this in a few minutes. So what they do is that if the setting is very different. They have a stationary measure. And instead of the geodesic flow, they have a random walk. But in some sense, it's, diff it's similar that you, ha you know that there's some exponential drift. If it's something very fast happens for a very small period of time, your vector v is in the direction of v1. And what you want to get is that you want to find a lot of points q with friends in the direction of v which is uh, your relate, uh, related to the highest Lyapunov exponent. And uh, so they use, so you have to replace this long stretch of time <laughs> that, uh, that allows you to use the ergodic theorem, Birkhoff ergodic theorem, by something else. And what they do is that they, they use uh, Martingale convergence theorem. But since we don't have time, I will um, just tell you what, uh, what we can use here. And instead of that, you want to use properties of, um, of the geodesic flow. And maybe I'll just draw a picture um, and the notion of entropy. OK. So, so here is a picture. I'll just draw the picture and, and just discuss it a little bit and see. Um, so the starting point here, I don't want it to be, we don't want it to be arbitrary. So uh, I want to start from two points which, under the geodesic flow, get very, very close to each other. And uh, then apply the u, which is whatever. Imagine it's a one-dimensional. It's just a unipotent flow. Let's say starting off with the measure, which is invariant on p. p, which is invariant on the g. It's over an entropy now. It's entropy g. Yeah, relative to this measure. Yeah, the, rest, the geodesic flow for, for this measure. And then, OK, so this is, this is supposed to be the picture uh, that I have two points which are very close. And I'm supposed to capture at some point, uh, maybe I'll call this, yeah, Q, Q prime, Q1, Q1 prime, Q2, Q2 prime, and I draw it like this to see if I can say something about it in a few minutes. Um, so, so I want to make sure that I have, I have to find a lot of points, uh, q1, q1 prime. This is kind of a positive measure that, you know, there are all sorts of bad properties, and everything will make you a into a compact set, which is, has a measure a little bit smaller, and that when you started it, make it smaller and smaller. And the problem is that you want all the points to be in a very nice set. And I want to get q1 and q1 prime such that when I go along the geodesic flow, somehow the difference between q1 and q1 prime is, with respect to this flag, is kind of generic, so that one direction wins. And this doesn't happen, but let's assume that this happens. So that this is in the direction of v1, almost. So v1 is some, or curly v1. 
things that grow like e to the lambda 1. And lambda 1 is the biggest, uh, biggest exponent. But, um, but why are there so many of these points? Where can we find so many of these points? That's where that's the first place that entropy comes in. So entropy is kind of, it shows how unpredictable your, your, uh, your flow is. But, um, but there is a lot of interesting things uh, done about entropy of the geodesic, let's say, flows. And um, in the setting, which is not exactly like what we do, it's either homogeneous or it's for C2 manifolds. Uh, but basically, the same things can apply here. And this is what I mean. It's a work of, uh, I think, Letrapier and Young. And also, uh, it's used by, uh, in the paper of Margulis and Tomanov. That is, you have something which is geodesic flow invariant. What happens, the conditional measure, which is some kind of, you disintegrate your measure with respect to different things. On, um, so you had W plus and W minus, some foliation of your space. If you, if the, and you can relate the entropy of the geodesic flow with what's happening, if you can disintegrate your measure with respect to W plus and W minus, what's happening on W plus and what's happening on W minus. If the entropy, if there's a lot of things happening on W plus, if somehow imagine your measure, you can disintegrate your measure nicely. So it's, there's some work goes into that, but it's just assumed that intuitively you disintegrate it. And um, imagine there's a lot of things happening on W plus. For example, your measure is invariant under UT. So there's a line, it's invariant under a line on W plus. That implies that entropy is positive. If the entropy is positive, there should be a lot of things happening on W minus, and, and I'm being extremely vague about this. But that means already that there, if you start with W minus, things which will allow you to produce a lot of the differentials um, getting close under the action of GT, you know, you can see there are a lot of Q1 and Q1 prime of distance roughly 1. So somehow, <coughs> It's not um, the, the entropy, and, it, and the same way, if you produce more and more on W plus, then the entropy argument will tell you that there are more and more things happening on W minus. You can always go back and forth between um, these two. And these are not exactly for our setting, but it's really this, it can be generalized to, to this setting very easily. So then you start with these two points, and you, you are on W minus, but at some point you want the two points to diverge along the geodesic. So if you're on W minus, the two points, if you go on, they just get closer and closer generically. And you can guarantee that very easily. Um, so, so you have to hit them with something so that they come out of their, um, like uh, this situation that they're just getting close to each other. So you hit them with uh, one of the elements randomly almost, uh, U, which you know invariance under. Imagine you're just, you know invariance under one dimensional unipotent flow. Then they are not on W minus anymore. Then you apply uh, GT, and they start diverging. And at some point, the distance is 1. And now the claim is, is wrong. It's this, this statement is wrong. But roughly, the claim is that they will be uh, somehow Q2 and Q2 prime are almost in the direction of uh, V1. And they're also almost in the direction of W plus. And in, the, in W plus, they will be in the direction of some new, new thing. But it's great that you have the multiplicative ergodic theorem because uh, you can now basically disintegrate your measure along new, uh, V1. And, and that's the type of argument that's used also in Benoit and, um, and also in Ratner's theory, I guess. So what happens is that these two guys, so let me just uh, put this a little bit down so that I can say a little bit here. In the limit, say you can make sure that these two are along V1. And you know there is a notion of uh, conditional measure along V1 that you want to say it's Lebeg, Lebeg if, if it's invariant under this V1, whatever it means. Um, and this is. This is very much, I mean, this is more or less like, it goes like this. Because if you go along GT, uh, basically, the two points get very close to each other. And if you have the direction of V1 here, if it's, imagine if it's something completely well-defined, 
continue and, and it's continuous on your space, which unfortunately is not, <laughs> but it's continuous on a big compact set. Then um, the two points are very close, so the conditional measure, whatever it is, is very close at these two points if they vary continuously or uniformly continuously. On the other hand, from here to here, all you are doing is you are doing GT, U, and GT, and the measure and everything, conditional measures, and everything is invariant under GT and U. So the conditional measure here and here are the same. On the other hand, the conditional measure here and here are the same. So it means that you have a line, and the conditional measure is invariant under a small shift. And you can make this shift smaller and smaller and prove that the conditional measure is invariant under, under any shift, and therefore it's the Lebesgue. Of course, the problem is that this argument is completely wrong for all sorts of reasons. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I told you a lot of lies. Uh, this thing doesn't uh, converge to V1. Uh, it's very difficult to make sure all the QIs are in, in a good set. Um, the conditional measure here and here are not the same. They are almost the same up to a unipotent matrix. So, uh, so the argument is not quite what I told you, but it's, I think, roughly the idea. <laughs> but, but basically, you can get more and more invariance um, and um, use the entropy argument to show that your measure is invariant under the other unipotent flow in SL2R. So basically, this argument implies that the measure is SL2R invariant and the conditional measures along uh, stable and unstable foliations are supported on, on some linear subspaces which will allow you uh, to prove theorem two. Just so it's sort of still you don't know that the measure is Lebesgue because it's possible that along all stable and stable things it's linear, but uh, in between you have a counter set of things getting close to each other. But um, maybe I'll stop here. <laughs>